Back in 1981, I had the American dream, the beautiful wife, the house in the suburbs, and a beautiful six-year-old son. And one day I went to work, kissed my son goodbye, and never saw him again. In two weeks, I became the parent of a murdered child, and I'll always be the parent of a murdered child. I still have the heartache. I still have the rage. I waited years for justice. I know what it's like to be there waiting for some answers. And over those years, I learned how to do one thing really well, and that's how to catch these bastards and bring them back to justice. I become a manhunter. I'm out there looking for bad guys. Life is priceless. No one deserves to die for no reason, especially over differences of a way of life. Anything can be worked out, made better, instead of running away from a problem. Somebody has to pay the price. Somebody has to serve the punishment for the life taken of another man. If Margot Lorraine Smith was here right now, I would, I'd probably ask her why. Why me? My parents are not the traditional type of parents. They were very quirky and fun, and they raised us in a very different lifestyle than most children. We were raised on a 10-acre ranch at the beach. We had all the animals and the waves we could handle. They're a very close-knit family. I mean, they did everything together. Every time he saw George, he usually would see her rain. Lorraine and the kids. If you talk to anybody that knows them, they would say the same thing. They were old hippies. They were different, a little bit off the grid, but they were happy. Me and George grew up together, surfed together. Eventually, George opened a place down the beach called Burger Smith's. My father built it from the ground up. It was always a work in progress. George was always adding on to it without permits. Most of our encounters were related to me being mayor and people complaining about what he was up to and me having to intervene in the middle. I drove by one day and it was closed. I guess he just made the decision. He just tired of fighting City Hall. In 94, after our restaurant was closed down, we moved to the country. It was definitely a change for all of us. And in 95, my little sister Saffron was born. And in 96, my little brother Sequoia was born. My dad worked a lot of odd and end jobs. He did his best to support his family, but money was a lot tighter than it was before we had our restaurant closed down. My dad's property at the beach was worth about three, four million dollars. She wanted him to sell more property to make some money, but he didn't want to sell it. He kept the property because he wanted to pass it down to his, you know, kids. 
Lorraine was Lorraine. George was George. Two different people. You know, she wanted to do it her way, he wanted to do it his way. It's like throwing two rocks in a tumbler and knock each other's edges off. There was friction, and where there's friction, there's fire sometimes, <laughs> and somebody gets burnt, and that was them. <laughs> it was like a love-hate relationship, you know? <laughs> I met my husband and I got married in 2003. So I didn't see a lot of stuff that happened. I think 2004, my mom met a man that lived down the road from her. Kind of started, I guess, dating per se, but at that time we didn't know how involved they were. George, he was freaking out, going, what are you doing? He goes, I'm leaving you, I'm leaving him, and I guess you got another boyfriend. She kind of just really changed her personality. Started dressing for herself. Probably not clothes that were completely appropriate for a mother at her age. She got to a point where, uh, where my parents were actually gonna get a divorce. And I remember that she moved out of the house and I was devastated. When my mom tried to file for a divorce, my dad, he did everything he could try to, to prevent that. George was willing to forgive Lorraine for everything that she had done. He wanted his life partner back, and he was willing to forgive every transgression. In 2005, he wrote a will that stated that when he died, my mom got everything. I mean, sometimes love is blind, and other people have to see for you. He said, bingo, I don't know what to do with her. I love her so much, you know, and I said, George, I think she's a little crazy myself. You need to get rid of her before she kills you. She got into some bad stuff and changed who she was. She was tired of being a mom. She didn't want the burden of having kids. definitely changed. I feel like she kind of lost herself mentally, that she went off the, went off the deep end and, and changed who she was. She was tired of being a mom. She didn't want the burden of having kids. I certainly think that the crowd she started to hang around with was part of that process. She flipped that switch that said, I am going to become the party girl, the promiscuous, the worst mother of the year. My dad just kind of seemed a little bit more depressed. As much as he cared, he didn't really, um, he didn't fight my mom about it too much. My dad started trying to fix up the beach house. He stayed there sometimes. My mother was getting neglectful, letting my little sister Saffron and my little brother Sequoia stay with me more often or taking them to my dad's. He'd be doing his own thing. And they pretty much take care of themselves a lot. My mom told people that we were being homeschooled, but she didn't homeschool us at all. I taught myself how to read and write, and Saffron, my sister, had trouble with it. When my sister Scarlett found out about that, she was very upset. I actually started homeschooling him. My mom got into some bad stuff. I really think my mom's boyfriend was pushing her to get the beach property sold. George let me personally hunt uh, 13 acres that he had. And then one day he said, well, you can't hunt it anymore. She sold it. And she signed my name and took the money and spent it. And I went, what? Oh, yeah. He said, I'm mad. They had a big fight. He went next door and had his friends and made up a, a will. 
and he changed his will, left everything to the kids, got her out of it, had them sign it and said, here, if something happens to me, give it to them. It may or may not have been the trigger. I think in her deluded mind that she would figure out a way to get that property back, that she's the mom. And those kids, even though she didn't give one damn about those kids, somehow she'd get back onto that will. On the night of August 6, 2007, Lorraine made contact with George. Lorraine indicated that she wanted to talk with George, possibly get back with a relationship. Lorraine met him at their favorite Mexican restaurant. They ate supper. Um, he had several drinks, margaritas. He loved her, and he wanted to get back with Lorraine. He would do anything for her. August 7, 2007, I received a phone call from Brazoria County Dispatch notifying me of a death investigation. I was dispatched to Follett's Beach in Surfside. I observed a deceased male. It was hard to recognize him due to severe trauma to his face. We checked the pockets and found the wallet. We were able to identify the deceased as George Smith. She asked if I could make someone disappear. He knew how George was killed and what he was killed with. On August 7, 2007, I was contacted by the Brazoria County Dispatch. I was called out to Follett's Beach, which is the county beach. The scene was real hard. The deceased had a raincoat laid out to the side of him with the uh, blood in the sand and the water coming up and down. It makes it very difficult. His head was bashed in. There was blood splatter for many feet from the, si the place where his body was lying. His face was unrecognizable. With the trauma to his face, we were unsure if he was hit by a vehicle or not. But we were able to identify the deceased as George Smith by his driver's license. We had learned that he had a residence in Surfside, went to the residence. Margaret Lorraine Smith was at the house. I notified her that her husband had passed away. At 9 o'clock in the morning, my mom phone called me and said, let me talk to your husband. And I was like, no, I know my dad's dead. Just tell me he's dead. And uh, she was like, no, I need to talk to Cortland. Let me talk to Cortland. And, uh, I knew he was dead. And I told her, I said, just tell me he's dead. I said, just tell me that he's not alive, because I know he's not. And then she was like, yeah, he, he, he died. You know, like, they found him dead, kind of. You know, the whole time I'm talking to her on the phone, you know, she sounds like she's crying. And I later find out from the investigator that not one tear was shed out of her eyes when she was telling me that my father had died. No tears. She just went off into how everything happened. It was almost as she was wanting to tell me her side. She said George had drank a lot of margaritas. He was too intoxicated to drive home. She would drive him home to Surfside. Lorraine stated that she stopped at a local convenience store, got him some more beer to drink. And then driving on the way home, George became very upset. Screaming and yelling. And kicked her out of the vehicle.
A couple of days later, Lorraine called me back at the office and stated that she wanted to revise her statement, that everything she told me wasn't true. When she voluntarily came to the police department and said, oh, excuse me, by the way, I know I'm a person of interest, but I got to tell you a different version of the story because you're not buying the first one. Really dumb. Really dumb. She was walking me through pretty much her statement. Then she became quiet. She made a statement, uh, I didn't mean to do it. Um, you know, it was an accident. And asking her what it was, uh, she never explained. Later, she told her kids that she was on the beach with their father. So we have Lorraine out there on the beach uh, with George. But she said she was not there during the time of the murder, that she left prior to anything happening to George. We still didn't know the whole story. What helped piece it all together, I received some information that there was an inmate at the Brazoria County Jail. He pretty much said he knew how George was killed and what he was killed with. He also said that he knew who killed George, Dylan Lowry. Lorraine met Dylan through a group of young adults that lived in the apartment behind where Lorraine's boyfriend lived at the time. First time I met her, she asked if I could make someone disappear. I asked her, what do you mean disappear? I, I mean, you want someone dead or you want someone to take somebody and take them on a trip? What do you want? She said, well, I just want them to disappear. She knew what she was doing. She planned it out for God knows how long. Didn't anybody think she was going to run? Margaret Lorraine Smith is very manipulating. What we know is Lorraine contacted Dylan Lowry. She said that she needed somebody to disappear. She then proceeded to tell me the person in question was uh, her sister's husband who was abusing her sister and her sister's children for years now. She said that she wanted, uh, she wanted something done about it and her sister was too afraid to do anything so she was taking it into her own hands and uh, trying to find a solution. She had counted out some money and handed it to me. I told her, well, I didn't want anything to do with whatever it was she had going on, and I tried to give her the money back. She refused to take the money, told me just to hold on to it. The inmate that contacted me told me that another friend of his was approached by Dylan and asked if he had a weapon. He then basically said, we don't have anything but a leaf spring. A leaf spring is uh, a flat piece of metal, heavy. It's a long bar, flat bar, probably a quarter of an inch thick. They set up their plan. Lorraine spent a lot of money getting George drunk on margaritas.
he was too intoxicated to drive home, she would drive him home. Lorraine stated that she stopped at the local convenience store. We went there and pulled the video. You could see her talking on the phone, looking out the windows. Pulling the cell phone records, we found out that the phone number that she had received a call from uh, belonged to a female. Um, I identified the female, took a statement from her, and later she stated that Dylan Lowry used her cell phone. Lorraine drove George out to the beach. No houses around, no lights. It would be dark. They'd get out to the beach, and they would be together. And that's what I figured the raincoat was for, it was for Lorraine. And she would make a reason that she needed to go back to the vehicle. Uh, she forgot something, and that's when Dylan would come up and kill George. The medical examiner's office was able to prove a leaf spring is what was used to kill George Smith. Yeah, I mean, she knew, she knew what she was doing. She planned it out for God knows how long because the property she started selling off, um, we find out that she used that money to pay the man to kill my dad. Dylan and, and Lorraine were both charged with the murder of George Smith. I drove to the apartment complex, arrested Dylan, and put him in the Brazoria County Jail. Me and a partner drove to Boyd, where Margaret was staying with her daughter, and arrested her for capital murder. Her bail was set at 500000 and they lowered it immediately. The judge actually said that um, since she wasn't the one that actually was the murderer, that her bail shouldn't have been set so high. The bail bonds company needed collateral, and so she actually signed the deed to the Surside property away. I will never get it. She was the instigator, the perpetrator up to the point, and was the brains behind the whole deal. Didn't anybody think she was gonna run? Dylan Lowry maintained his innocence in trial and pleaded not guilty. It sounds to me as if she did it herself. Margot Lorraine planned everything and followed through with the, the plan and uh, executed and killed her husband, George Smith, at the beach. Uh, because it was just all too too sloppy for somebody who supposedly was a hitman. Dylan Lowry was convicted and is serving life with no parole. A uh, year and a half, almost two years later, uh, Lorraine is called to go to court where she does not show up. Weeks before her trial was set to start in 2009, Lorraine cut her ankle monitor off, told her probation officer that she would be at a doctor's appointment. Lorraine got a ride from Angleton to Houston. We collected video where it does show that Lorraine was dropped off at the hospital. And then she's just walking straight out of the hospital. And she has some large baggage with her. It was several days later that she was seen for the last time picking up money at a Western Union in San Antonio. And she's been on the run ever since. The land she used so she could get out of jail, a bond. She ended up losing it when she ran. Unfortunately, there's nothing left from the property. The bail bonds company sold it for a very small amount of what it was worth. We couldn't fight for it. We couldn't afford to fight for it. After all of her horrible planning, after arranging George's brutal murder, she lost it because she skipped her bond. It went to nobody in that family. 
the main purpose of killing George so she would get a windfall of money. She blew it all. I miss him. I miss that quirky laugh and that crazy kid. George is up in heaven doing the Holy Ghost Shuffle. He's dancing and looking at the sea of glass, thinking, man, I can surf this. I can surf this. God, give me a board. <laughs> Margaret Lorraine Smith has a mole on her bottom right eyelid. She often dyes her naturally dark curly hair or wears wigs. She has a thyroid condition that requires medication. She may be moving back and forth between Mexico and the U.S. If you've seen Margaret Lorraine Smith or have any information regarding her whereabouts, go to our website, cnn.com slash the hunt. You can remain anonymous. We'll pass your tip to the proper authorities, and if requested, will not reveal your name. I have nightmares. He's laying next to me, standing over me a lot, forcing me to go somewhere. Most of them end up with a ton of torture and then I wake up before I die. I've said it for years, pedophilia is a compulsion. So many pedophiles aren't violent, they're the groomers. Paul Winkleblack, on the other hand, if the opportunity presents itself, he's gonna strike. He's the predator. So it had been the weekend and I got the okay from my grandmother to spend the night at my best friend's. Uh, her mom had a new boyfriend, and so we went to go visit him at a house that he was working on. I got a, kind of a weird feeling when I met him. to the house, we did it, you know, normal girl stuff, what love girls did, played makeup, dress up, uh, you know, and then went to bed. I recall being asleep for hours and then waking up to an older man next to me. It was her mom's new boyfriend. He was cuddled around me and he was awake. He got up and grabbed my hand and forced me to walk with him and, and go into the sunroom with him. I remember it just being a small room. He proceeded asking me questions about my family. Your address, your name, your, your phone number, your mom's name. Then he said that he knew my mother, uh, that she would be the first to be killed if I said anything. And then it would be me being tortured and killed. He put lotion all over his hands. I 
I was so terrified. It just seemed like it was forever. He fell asleep. I didn't do much sleeping. About 7.30, he told me that I could go. When I got home, I ran straight to the bathroom. My grandma initially knew something was wrong right away. This is what's so darn brave about Megan is she went right away and told her grandmother, and her grandmother did the right thing. She immediately took me to the ER. They did a rape kit. I told the story, and you know, when it had happened, All I could stare at was that alarm clock. So I knew minute for minute what he had done to me. Winkle Black was convicted of first degree sodomy. He was sentenced to eight years and four months in prison and given 20 years of post-prison supervision, which is known as parole. When he got out, he was ordered not to have any contact with minors because of that 98 offense but his nature is such that that opportunity presented itself. And he took advantage of it, and he harmed someone again. When he got out from prison, Paul Winkleblack ended up dating several other women at the time. One of these was a, a woman who was a single mom. She was in her mid-40s, um, and she had a teenage daughter. On February 26, 2010, um, a mother and daughter came into our police office in Wilsonville and wanted to report that an individual had touched her. The mother was awakened by her daughter's screams. Paul Winkleblack leaves the residence. A guy like Paul Winkleblack, he doesn't think, what are the consequences? How am I going to get away with this? A guy like him is willing to roll all the dice. He's looking at going back to prison for this. That puts a person like Winkleblack on the run. The incident that I end up investigating, Ashley and Jessica go to the Snoop Dogg concert downtown in Portland. Happen and seen, everything that's going on, and they make their way back to their car. This man walks up to them, introduces himself as Paul, and says that he is working with the Portland police, that he is a spotter for the Portland police on a DUI mission. He says that their whole mission is to make it so that people don't drive drunk. He says, how about I just, I'll drive you home? There's plenty of us out tonight. I'll get one of my buddies to pick me up at your house. You said you didn't live far? So they talk about it, and they're like, you know, OK. And he gets in the car, and they leave. And the girls think this is wonderful. They are just so excited that they have a police officer in their car. And as they're driving along, Paul Winkleblack looks at Jessica in the back. Can I borrow your phone? I want to call my friend so that I can get a ride when I get to your place. Jessica says, sure. He sort of acts for a second like he's trying to do something. Then he puts it under his leg. He says, it's not working. Then he says to Ashley, hey, can I borrow yours? Same thing. I want to call my friend. But Ashley is noticing they're getting close to where they need to turn. She gives him the cell phone, and he just puts it under his leg. He goes through the light and heads out onto the highway. She now starts yelling at him, give me my phone back. And Jessica's in the back saying, yeah, give her her phone back. He pulls out the knife and puts it right into Ashley's stomach. It's way better to fight 
fight, yell, scream, than be compliant because the last several hours of her life will be horrible. Paul Winkleblack pulls out the knife on Ashley, but moved it up to her chest, um, even up to her neck at one point, and back down. Whenever he would get heightened, they would pass a semi, or she wasn't doing exactly what he said. He would press in a little bit more, just pressing the point about what he was willing to do to her. This is probably the fifth pedophile that I've been involved with who has waited outside of concerts and said, I will drive you home or I will get in your car. I'm a parking lot security guard. I'm an off-duty cop. And you're tipsy. You're going to get a DUI. It's become a standard with these kidnapping predators. They're now on the highway. They're on I-5. They're headed south. Ashley starts trying to bargain with him. We'll give you money. I have $50. She's pulling $50 out of her boot. They start telling him about their family and that they need to be at work the next day. He's like, don't worry about it. You're not going to be at work. As he's holding the knife to Ashley in the car, Jessica now has started in the back going, I have to pee, I have to pee. He pulls off into a dark area. He tells him, OK, get out, go pee. And he watches him like a hawk. Jessica starts yelling at him, look away, look away. I can't do this when you're, you're looking at me, look away. She rushes him and dives into the car. No keys. She runs. Ends up seeing a house and pounds on it so hard that the couple inside felt like it was an earthquake. 911? We've got a gal at our door saying that someone's out to kill her. And she just came to your door? Yeah. In the meantime, Ashley is now fighting with Paul Winklebrook. Another car comes down the highway. Ashley runs toward the car. Paul Winklebrook thought this guy was going to help, so he took off in their car. Well, the guy in the car, you know, he thinks something's fixing to happen to him. He takes off. So she starts running in the same direction that Jessica went. They find each other again. Oh, no. <laughs> and did he have any, a gun? Yeah. We do have uh, an officer dispatch. Years ago, a, a cop told me, he said, tell your daughter it's way better to fight, fight, yell, scream than to ha be compliant because the last several hours of her life will be horrible. So take that shot. These guys are cowards. If they try to drag you in the car, scream and yell. But I got to say, they were lucky, because it easily could have gone the other way. The next day, we found the car, about 10 miles away from where the incident happened, where the girls had gotten free. Paul Winkleblack fancies himself a survivalist. He liked to go out in that area where the car had been found. Having this happen to me and being traumatized has forced me to switch states and move far away from somewhere, some place that I once loved, because I don't feel fully safe exposing my identity and what I look like. I just want him captured and put away forever. I've been hunting bad guys for over three decades, and I'm always glad and greatly relieved to share the news that their reign of terror is over. And this is one of those times.